On tonight's summary of the Israel-Hamas War, Day 184. Initial progress reported in a high-level hostage negotiation summit that took place in Cairo. The sides are supposed to reconvene in two days. Amidst monumental U.S. pressure, the Israeli government officials are stating that Netanyahu is desperate for a hostage deal and that the killing of the world's central kitchen workers, quote, has changed everything. The death toll of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, including civilians and militants, has crossed 33,000. The IDF pulled its forces out of Han Yunus. For the first time since the invasion began, there is no active fighting in the Gaza Strip. The IDF forces are maintaining only the Nitzarim Corridor. Record number of humanitarian aid trucks enter the Gaza Strip since the war began. The IDF has imposed a siege on Nebi Elias village in the West Bank after a Palestinian who carried out a shooting attack escaped to that region. El Arabi Al Jadid quoted the Egyptian sources stating that humanitarian truce may be possible for Eid al Fitar, that is later this week. Hello everyone, I am Alon Burstein, visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute Fellow at the University of California, Irvine, here bringing you the latest summary of the Israel Hamas War. It is currently the evening of April 7th, 2024 in the United States, the morning of April 8th, 2024 in the Middle East. Since I have not been here for a few days, this summary is not only going to include the last 24 hours, but also some of the major updates from the last several days. Starting with the hostage situation, in the last several days, the IDF managed to retrieve the body of one of the Israeli hostages who had been kidnapped into the Gaza Strip on October 7th, alive, and since was killed in the Gaza Strip. Between Friday night and Saturday, the IDF carried out an operation in Han Yunus and retrieved the body of Elad Katsir. He was last seen alive in a video that was released by the Palestinian Islamic Jihad on January 8th. The organization did not mention anything about him since then. The estimates in the IDF is that he was killed shortly after that video was, was taken. The IDF followed an intelligence lead and carried out the raid into Han Yunus, where his body was unearthed and retrieved and taken back to Israel. With that, that leaves 133 hostages that remain in the Gaza Strip, of which over 30 are confirmed dead by the IDF. According to different reports, both the IDF intelligence and U.S. intelligence suspect that at least 20 more hostages may also be dead. However, neither of the agencies confirmed that estimate. In other news, a senior negotiators summit is being held in Cairo. The top negotiators include the same team from the different Paris summits, that is the CIA Director William Barnes, Qatari Prime Minister Mohammed Athani, Egyptian Head of Intelligence Abbas Kamel, and for Israel, the head of the Mossad Dedi Barnea, the head of the Shabak Ronen Bar, and the retired IDF General Nitzan Alon. While there was no change in the positions of the sides prior to the summit, it is estimated that the United States has applied monumental pressure on both sides to come to a deal, and this may actually produce results in this round of negotiations. Sources close to the negotiations are quoted as saying that the U.S. is tired of the sides dragging their feet and is applying massive unequivocal pressure on Israel and in turn also applying such pressure on Qatar and Egypt to compel Hamas to reach a deal. Related to this, Sky News today quoted senior Israeli government officials stating that Netanyahu is, quote, desperate for a hostage deal and that the killing of the world's central kitchen workers has changed everything. I'll say more about the U.S. response to that incident later in the report, but in regards to the hostage deal, I will say that there has been reportedly growing fear in the Israeli government that the Biden administration is going to end up forcing a truce or a ceasefire on Israel regardless of a hostage deal as a result of the deteriorating situation in the Gaza Strip, and this is likely why there is now pressure to reach a deal before that possible eventuality. In a statement today, marking six months to the war, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu stated that there will be no ceasefire without returning the hostages. However, he also went out of his way to thank the Biden administration for still adhering to the fact that no ceasefire can can occur without a hostage deal. So this again shows that there is growing fear within Israel that the Biden administration may at some point change that position. The Israeli team to the hostage negotiations in Cairo was reportedly given a much more expanded negotiating mandate by the Israeli cabinet, likely to negotiate the return of Gazan civilians to the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. It was also reported that Hamas is sending a delegation, and importantly, this delegation was going to be headed by Halil al-Haya, who is the deputy of Yahya Sinwar. This is important because that means that the internal leadership of Hamas is being represented in the talks, rather than the external leadership that usually is the one carrying on negotiations in Qatar. However, they have a lot less power and flexibility to negotiate. 
At the end of the first day of these negotiations, the Egyptian newspaper al Kahara al-Ahbariya reported substantial advances that took place in the talks, as well as broad agreement between the sides. According to the report, the delegations are going to leave Cairo for consultations and are going to return to Cairo in two days to finalize the deal. If this is so, this means that this is the biggest breakthrough that has been reported thus far. It was not reported what the sides agreed upon with regards to Hamas's demands of an ultimate ceasefire and IDF withdrawal from the Gaza Strip. Likely we're going to learn more about this in the next 24 to 48 hours. Other news related to the hostage situation. A funeral wreath was sent to the family members of Liri Albeg, one of the hostages held in the Gaza Strip and as far as is known, still alive. While there is no knowledge of her condition, the note stated, May she rest in peace, we all know that the state is more important. Following leads the Israeli Shabak is investigating, it was determined that the order was placed by a number that is known to be affiliated with Iranian agents, and the Shabak is investigating what is the meaning of the fact that this reef was sent. Right now, just to summarize, the hostage negotiations in Cairo are complete and the sides are going back to, the, back to their respective leaderships for consultations. However, we're likely to hear more about this in the coming days. I'll remind everyone that Eid al-Fitar, the holiday that marks the end of Ramadan, is due to start on Tuesday, and it is possible that the sides are going to try to time this truce, or the beginning of some sort of phase towards a truce and a hostage exchange for this holiday. Moving on to the Gaza Strip, there were barrages of rockets fired from the Gaza Strip towards the areas surrounding the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. These include rockets targeting the areas of Miftahim, Stenitsan, and Tsochal. Over the past days, there have been several barrages of rockets that were also fired towards Sderot, Kisufim, and other areas surrounding the Gaza Strip. Regarding the fighting in the Gaza Strip, there has been a lot of reports in the last several days of fighting and intensive gun battles in the areas of Hanunis, specifically in the western areas of Al-Amal and the eastern areas of Al-Qarara. The IDF reported locating and detonating a 900-meter tunnel in the Al-Amal region of Hanunis that was reportedly used as a weapon storage. In addition to that, though, in the last 24 hours, after over three months of engagement, the IDF announced the completion of its operation in Hanunis. The IDF began evacuating its forces from the area, and with this retreat of IDF forces, the today marks the first day since the ground invasion began on October 20th that the IDF is not engaged in advanced fighting anywhere in the Strip. The only IDF forces that remain in the Gaza Strip right now are the IDF forces that are holding the Nitzarim Corridor, that is the east-to-west corridor that the IDF is maintaining, that divides the Gaza Strip between north and south. This is the least amount of IDF soldiers that have been in the Gaza Strip since the war began. Shortly after the IDF evacuated the areas of Hanunis, a barrage of five rockets was fired from these areas that the IDF withdrew from, and some of these were intercepted. In addition, internally displaced Palestinians were seen making their way back from Rafah towards the areas of Hanunis throughout the day. It's important to note that the IDF has not specifically ordered Palestinians to begin the moving from Rafah to Hanunis. However, the IDF did seemingly allow Palestinians to come back to the areas that were evacuated, and streams of Palestinians were seen coming back to the areas of Hanunis throughout the day. Related to this, the IDF Chief of Staff, Herzi Alevi, stated today that this withdrawal does not mean an end to the IDF operation in Gaza, but rather a strategic redeployment in order to continue the fighting. Other sources in Israel also suggested that this may be a preliminary stage in, in order to begin moving towards the invasion of Rafah, as there is going to be a need to evacuate hundreds of thousands of civilians from Rafah to the surrounding areas, and possibly this is one of the first things that the IDF wants to do is pull its forces out of Hanunis. However, I'll say again, despite the fact that Palestinians were seen going from Rafah to Hanunis, this is not something that the IDF ordered in the last 24 hours. Regarding casualties, and this includes figures from the last several days, the total number of IDF soldiers that are reported killed in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began has gone up to 260. In addition, the total number of IDF soldiers that have been injured in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began is 1,559. The Palestinian Health Ministry in the Gaza Strip is reporting that since the war began, 33,137 Palestinians have been killed in the Gaza Strip, and 75,815 Palestinians have been injured since the war began. I remind everyone that there are also reportedly still seven to 10,000 Palestinians that are buried under the rubbles of the different bombings and are presumed dead. According to the latest IDF figures, the IDF estimates that some 12,000 Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and other militants have been killed in the Gaza Strip.
Moving on to the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip, and also starting from reports in the last several days. On Tuesday, I reported about the incident in which seven workers of the World Central Kitchen, this is a humanitarian aid organization the IDF have been working with, were killed in an IDF attack. Amidst the different responses to this act, which included the World Central Kitchen suspending its activities in Gaza and the United Arab Emirates suspending its participation in the Maritime Corridor to bring more humanitarian aid in, the Biden administration was reportedly furious and a conversation was scheduled between President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. As a result of the U.S. demands that were raised in these conversations, Prime Minister Netanyahu led the Israeli cabinet to remove major restraints on the entrance of humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip, and according to what was decided in the last several days, the Israeli port of Ashdod is going to be open to allow humanitarian aid destined for the Gaza Strip to come through Israel, and Israel is also going to open the Erez crossing, this is the major crossing into the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, that has been closed since the war began. The Biden administration also reportedly insisted on an increase on an increase of humanitarian aid trucks that will enter the Gaza Strip at least 500 per day. It's important to note that this is what was going to be part of the initial negotiations in the last round. Now, according to reports, this is what Biden is demanding of Israel, regardless of the negotiations. Later in the evening today, the IDF reported that a record high of 322 aid trucks were inspected and entered the Gaza Strip in the past 24 hours. Egypt also announced that it intends to increase the amount of trucks that enter the Gaza Strip to 300 per day. This is a record of the amount of trucks that have entered the Gaza Strip since the war began. So I'll say again, the Biden administration is demanding an increase to 500 trucks per day. It was not reported that the Israeli cabinet agreed to that. However, there has been a marked increase since that demand. Other news also from the last several days. After I suggested a week ago that it is possible that the IDF has been cooperating with the Palestinian Authority and Fatah in order to secure humanitarian aid trucks that enter the Gaza Strip, and I speculated this because several Fatah members were killed by Hamas reportedly for cooperating with the IDF, on Wednesday, April 3rd, this speculation was in fact confirmed. A report stated that the War Cabinet in Israel approved in the past several weeks the cooperation between the IDF and Fatah members and the security forces of the Palestinian Authority to help protect humanitarian aid trucks that come into the Gaza Strip. According to reports, this was coordinated with the head of the Palestinian Authority intelligence, Majid Faraj, which makes it a very high-level coordination. It is not just the IDF coordinating with local activists on the ground, but rather the IDF coordinating with the Minister of Intelligence within the Palestinian Authority. It was reported, however, that the security officials are armed with clubs only, not with weapons, and that in fact several of them were killed by Hamas for cooperating with the IDF. Moving on to the West Bank, and again starting with some reports from the last several days, amidst the growing tension between the U.S. administration and the Netanyahu government, the Financial Times reported on Friday, April 5th, that the U.S. is planning on marking products that are made in the settlements, and this matches the same practice that is done in the EU. In the United States, that has not been the practice. In fact, several states passed laws saying that you cannot mark products that come from the settlements that will be tantamount to boycotting Israel, which into itself is illegal in several different states. However, according to the Financial Times, the United States is considering itself allowing the marking of products that were made in the settlements. Other news from the last 24 hours, there was a Palestinian attack that occurred in Road 55 in the West Bank, this is the area near Kalkilia. A Palestinian arrived on the scene and uh, on the road and dismounted from his vehicle hiding in the fields when he then fired his M16 weapon on passing cars and on a bus. One IDF soldier was badly injured when the bus she was in was shot at and the bus driver was also injured. The attacker escaped on foot, and it was later discovered that his car was also packed with dozens of kilos of explosives, which were likely intended to be used in a larger operation, however this was dismantled by the IDF. The IDF is reportedly in pursuit of the attacker, and a siege has been imposed on the village of Nebi Elias in the areas around Kalkilia. It remains to be seen how this develops. Political news from the last 24 hours. Betsal Smotrich, who is not only the finance minister, he is also a minister in Israel's defense ministry who is in charge of the civil administration, which makes him in charge of settlements, announced today the completion of a process that he began a year ago, granting official legal status to four unauthorized settlements that have been established in the West Bank. Now, just to clarify, an unauthorized settlement means a settlement that was established by grassroots organizations and activists on the ground rather than by the Israeli government. Usually these are established as strongholds in the West Bank and they are considered illegal even by Israeli law. 
The four settlements, Mishmar Yehuda, Shacharit, Beit Chugla, and Asael, now have legal status and are recognized by Israel. This means that they are settlements that are considered legal by Israeli standards, which would count for major development for the settlement movement in the West Bank. Other news, Walid Daka, who is the longest serving Palestinian prisoner in Israel, making him a person of a lot of stature within the Palestinian population in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, died today in, in a prison hospital from cancer. Daka was convicted of kidnapping and murdering an IDF soldier in 1984 and has been in prison since 1986. Again, he is the most longest serving Palestinian prisoner, which when I sometimes talk about the heavier Palestinian prisoners, it puts him very high up there. The, in different hostage exchanges in the past, Hamas has often demanded his release. However, Israel has never agreed. Moving on to the northern parts of Israel, southern parts of Lebanon, and Syria. After the attack in the Iranian consulate in Damascus, which until now Israel has not taken responsibility for, however it is widely ex uh, accepted, including by the United States, that it was done by Israel, there is growing anticipation for an Iranian retaliation in the last several days and likely in the coming week. Over the past days, several different intelligence agencies estimated that Iran is going to retaliate with a swarm of drones and missiles that will be fired towards Israel, either launched by an affiliated militia in the Middle East or possibly from Iran itself. It was also estimated, however, that Iran is not interested in a full-on war escalation, but rather would like to have a quote-unquote quality retaliation, preferably in the form of hitting an Israeli diplomatic mission in the same way that their diplomatic mission was, was hit in Damascus. Related to this, Yahya Rahim Sefavi, who is an advisor to Iran's supreme leader Ali Khamenei, stated today that Israeli embassies around the world are no longer safe. In Israel, there has been growing preparation, including the idea for refreshing emergency warehouses and provisions, and a complete freeze on any leave taken by anyone in the Air Force. There are also a lot of different intelligence assessments, and the Minister of Defense and the Chief of Staff have all said that Israel is now fully prepared for whatever retaliation Iran throws at its way. In addition to this, there is also another round of escalations in the last several days between Israel and Hezbollah. After an IDF drone was shot down by a surface-to-air missile in Lebanon, the IDF carried out a substantial attack in the Baalbek region in the northeastern sections of Lebanon. Reportedly, three Hezbollah infrastructures of the movement's air defense units were bombed. According to some reports, the attacks took place in the Janta town of the Beka Valley. It was not reported how many people were injured or killed in these attacks. Regarding updates from the last 24 hours, there were continuous barrages of rockets fired from Lebanon targeting the northern parts of Israel. These included a barrage of 30 rockets that were fired towards the Golan Heights, the areas of Mirom, Golan, and Ein Ziva. In addition, there were other launches towards the areas of Tzfat and the Upper Galilee, areas like Dalton, Gush Chalav, Kadita, Kfar Choshen. Many interceptions were noted in that barrage. Rockets were also fired towards the areas of Hardov, Margoliot, and Menara. Regarding IDF activity, the IDF carried out a series of attacks targeting Hezbollah's Radwan force. This is Hezbollah's main commando units that are tantamount to Hamas's Nuhba forces. These include bombings of military compound housing seven structures of the Radwan force in the areas of El Khiam and a command center in the Torah village. Attacks were also reported against launching sites in the Kohava area and Misil Jabil. Other rounds of bombings targeting Hezbollah infrastructure were also reported in the areas of Kila village, and rocket launchers were also attacked in the areas of Yarun. Al Manar also reported artillery fire in the areas of Itaron. Later in the day, it was reported that three people, one of whom was a commander of the Radwan force, were killed in an IDF attack in the areas of As Saltanaya as well. Amidst this, Hezbollah also reported another death of a member of its ranks, bringing the, the total number of operatives that Hezbollah says have been killed since the war began to 272. Again, the IDF states that number is at least 50 higher, well over 320, 330. Moving on to some of the regional developments, Houthi spokesperson Yahya Saria stated today that in the past three days, the Houthis have carried out five different attacks. These include firing nautical missiles at a British ship in the Red Sea, ballistic missiles that were fired at two Israeli ships in the Indian Ocean and the Arab Sea, and two drones that were launched targeting U.S. warships in the Red Sea. Earlier in the day, UKMTO did report an incident in the Red Sea. However, I will say that in the last several days, there have been no reports of any ships that were specifically hit 
by these different missiles, and the Houthi spokesperson himself did not say that any damage was done, just that these operations were carried out. It's important to note that we are coming up on Eid al-Fitr, that is, the last days of Ramadan. Up until now, the Houthis have promised a lot of escalations during the month of Ramadan, and we have seen more activity, but nothing, I will say, too substantial. Remains to be seen what is in store in the coming week. Moving on to some of the political updates, and this time also starting from the last several days. After the World Central Kitchen incident, as condemnations poured in from all over the world regarding the killing of seven workers of the World Central Kitchen by IDF drones in the Gaza Strip, the U.S. appeared to take a more forceful tone with the Israeli government than it ever has. In addition to reports about the administration being furious with, with Prime Minister Netanyahu, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan made veiled and not-so-veiled threats towards Israel, stating that real change has to occur on the Israeli side with regards to the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip, and if this change does not occur within the coming the hours and days of from when this statement was made, then there will be change from our side, i.e. from the position of the United States vis-a-vis -vis Israel. The White House also stated that Biden made clear to Netanyahu that the U.S. policy towards Gaza will be determined based upon the immediate actions of Israel with regards to the humanitarian situation. It was in light of this that within less than 24 hours of that phone call, the Israeli cabinet approved the opening of the Ashdod port and the opening of the Erez crossing, which I stated above. I will say also that has been announced, however, it has not happened yet. When that does happen, it is likely to be somewhat of a game changer with regards to the humanitarian situation in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. Remains to be seen when that actually does happen. Again, it may be during the upcoming Eid al-Fitr. Other news in the last 24 hours, continuing this international pressure on Israel, the UK Foreign Minister David Cameron also published an op-ed in the Sunday Times today, stating that as far as the UK is concerned, our support for Israel depends on Israel living up to international humanitarian law. So this is very similar to what the United States is saying, that the support for Israel is moving to be conditioned on Israel's actions in the Gaza Strip rather than being unconditional. Possibly related to this, Al Arabi al Jadid quoted the Egyptian sources today, stating that there is a chance for a temporary truce during Eid al Fitr. This is the last days of Ramadan, which are going to occur between Tuesday and Friday this week. The report did not state if this is associated with that advance, those advancements that I stated above with regards to the hostage deal, so it remains to be seen what this specifically relates to. It is possible this is also going to be some sort of attempt of Israel, or specifically of, the, of Prime Minister Netanyahu, to show that he is working to ease the situation in the Gaza Strip. It remains to be seen. We'll learn more about this in the coming days. And finally, the incoming Irish Taoiseach, that is Prime Minister Simon Harris, stated today that the Irish people are ready to recognize a Palestinian state. In this, he joined statements that were made by the leaders of Spain, who said that they are going to recognize a Palestinian state by July, said that several days ago, and they also stated that other members in the EU are likely to do the same. Simon Harris also stated, We condemn the massacre that Hamas perpetrated and call for the hostages to be released. But we cannot be silent over Israel's actions. Addressing Prime Minister Netanyahu directly, he stated, quote, The Irish people cannot be clearer. We are disgusted by your actions. Declare a ceasefire and allow the entrance of humanitarian aid. With that, I will say that, similar to all these reports, the biggest developments in the political arena in the last several days remain tied to that incident with the aid workers of the World Central Kitchen. Among others, it's important to follow the fact that the World Central Kitchen has suspended its activities in the Gaza Strip. The World Central Kitchen was instrumental in working to deliver food in the Gaza Strip, specifically to the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. Remains to be seen how they are going to react to the report that the IDF put out about how and why the mistake was made, official apologies that were made. Remains to be seen what is going to be the humanitarian situation if there's going to be an increase in the entrance of aid trucks. However, if the aid agency that has been instrumental in delivering the food is now not going to be, going to be operating in the Gaza Strip, remains to be seen how this develops and how this may be tied to the negotiations and a possible truce. Again, we're going to find out more about this in the coming days. If you find these reports important, please do remember to hit that like button, subscribe, turn on notifications if you want to know when reports come out. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. That is my report for the last 24 hours. I'll be back tomorrow.